Maybe you're getting a sense of which is more underneath you, which is more organized for standing. Which has more agency for standing? Does one belong to you more? Do you have more of an ownership around one versus the other? And if one leg has the agency for standing, does the other leg have agency for something else like fidgeting or kicking or like what, what are your legs good for? What possibilities for action do they offer you? Walking, running, swimming. I worked with a little boy for years who didn't know he had legs for a while. And I remember um, I used to see kids at home and his mum and I were out in the kitchen having a little chat about him. And he was just playing on the floor in, the, in our lounge room. Um, and he used to roll everywhere. Uh, so he's quite mobile in that sense, but didn't, he, he rolled from his arms. So he has cerebral palsy and his legs, he was diplegic. So his legs were quite palsied. Um, and we came back in to the, to the room and he had his legs up over his chest and he was playing with his feet and we both kind of burst into tears because he'd never had his legs up because he didn't have legs before then. And then he had legs. Now he still didn't walk to, he was probably about three or four then. Um, and he, he wasn't really interested in walking until eight and then he had surgery and he started walking a little bit. He only really got interested in walking when some chance remark that I made when he was about 12 or 13 because he really wanted to learn to drive. And I said, well, you have to, it's much easier to get into a car if you can walk into it. It's, it's you know, getting into a car from a wheelchair is possible, but it's harder work. And then he went, okay. And he got interested in walking again. So his agency and ownership in his legs is still pretty tenuous. He's still a lot more mobile in his wheelchair than walking, but he's realised that walking does give him access in a, in a, you know, to situations that motivate him. Okay, so come up to standing. So remember yesterday we did all this on, uh, on the left leg and I left you quite one-sided because I have infinite faith in the corpus callosum, which swaps. That's the big, big, big set of tracts that connects the two hemispheres. It's massive. So the connectivity between the two hemispheres is fabulous, which is why we don't feel like two halves. We feel like a whole. Now begin to shift your weight a little bit, and we'll go through some of the explorations we did on the left leg. We'll do on the right leg. So take a stance in Victoria, take a stance. And shift your weight onto your right leg. And have your left leg out to the side. So you're on your left toe. And tilt a little bit to the right, just enough to sort of engage to, so that you really are on that right leg and the left leg is really incidental. And now take your head back. And do that a few times. So you, you stay on the right leg and you can take your head back. So your chin comes away from your chest. And then add in that extra requirement that your weight goes more to your heel as you take your head back. So, yeah. How do you find a way of make it? Maybe you need to take your weight more onto the toes and then onto the heel to know the difference. With your head back. Rest when you need to. And then when you, you're somewhat satisfied that 
your weight is more towards the heel and your head can be back and you can breathe, begin to move your right hip a little bit left and a little bit right. So does, your, does somewhere in your system remember this from yesterday or had you eradicated it as just some horrible nightmare from yesterday? What did your brain do with this experience overnight? You remember I said sleep is, a, is for consolidating memory and learning. You had bad dreams last night. And can you find a way that that right hip joint could be a little bit mobile? Which means you have to be a little bit mobile in the ankle, a little bit mobile in the, in the trunk to accommodate that hip moving left and right in between the ankle and the trunk, as it were. Good, come back to wait even for a minute, give your either hip a, a spell. And come back onto the right leg again with the left leg out and tilt your head back and increase the tilt to the right so that you lift your, so your left leg clearly lifts off. So you're lifting the left leg and with the head back at the same time, like really lifting the le left leg back, not just unweighting it. No, you don't have to worry about the heel for this one. I'm not that mean. Yep, so you're standing on your right leg and your left leg's out to the side. Tilt your head back. And now tilt to the right more and, and lift up your left leg. And clap. And breathe. And draw a picture of yourself. No, don't draw a picture of yourself. Or frown. Heads back. As back as is comfortable. Yeah, I'm not going to say right back because it, it's up to you. So, so long as in your tracking of yourself, your head is back somewhere. So it's not straight up. That's the thing. Good. I'll walk a bit. No. Fantasy. Fantasy. We don't remember, come back to your spot. It's only a little walk, remember. If you went for a great big long journey, find your way home quickly or quickly without hurrying. And take your weight onto your right foot. And this time have your left leg in front of you. So the, the left big toes on the floor in front of you. Your weight's on your right leg. Tilt your head back. Find that balancing point and now find a way where you can lift up your left leg and your arms with your head back. Little bit, well, yes and no. Try both. Try not moving the trunk and moving the trunk. You, you can, yes, you do, you can, yes, it, it, you are lifting your leg and lifting your arms and there are two ways that you can do it. You can lift them by tilting the trunk further back and you can just lift them and I'd, it would be nice to do both. If you can find a third way, because you're in the army, you know, there's always a third way, do it. I'm not going to, I don't know what it is, but because I'm not doing the lesson, but I'm not in the army either. You could do that. Yeah. 
<laughs> Jenny's being stupid. No, creative. <laughs> the third way. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear and can you breathe and can you let your mouth hang open like if you had to really go back that who taught that lovely lesson where you take the top of the head away from the lower you take the upper jaw away from the lower jaw you can do that Lynn, yeah it's, so you could do that could really take the up the upper jaw even further away. Uh, now I'm t I kid. This is not me messing with your head. She, that Elizabeth actually teaches that. She says it. She actually says you can use your tongue to help you. I think that's a stretch. And then she says, actually, if you stop holding your jaw, it'll be easier to balance. She's, is she correct? Ah. I wouldn't argue with Elizabeth. I'm just, I find her vaguely intimidating. Don't put, don't put that on the tape. <laughs> Strike it, Rock. Yes. Good. Rest on the mat. On your mat. The mat. Rest on the mat. We'd slowly roll over, come up to standing. And now we'll move on to the explorations for today. <clears throat> Stand on your left leg. Have your right leg out to the side. And this time, instead of arching your back backwards to hit, head, have your head back, tuck your chin forwards and round your back. And how round can you get your back while you're standing on this left leg? So letting your head come forward and your back is rounding. So as the C curve goes forward now, that's it. And do that a few times so that you, really, you get really good at having a forward C curve. And then the next time you do it, make the C-curve in such a way that the weight goes onto your left heel. And find a place where you, your head can hang and your back can arch in a way that's sustainable. And is this easier for you than arching your back in a C-curve the other way? And now in that position where your weight is on your heel and your, your back is rounded forwards, take your left hip a little bit to the right and the left. Uh, your weight's, so yeah, you're on, the weight's on the heel and the left leg is out to the side 
and your left hip is moving a little bit to the right and the left. So right, uh, right legs out to the side and your left hip is moving a little bit left and right. Not a lot of weight on your right leg, no. You're really organising over your left hip joint. However, the left hip joint is finding how much it can move and again, notice that there's a, a counter movement in the ankle. And there might be a counter movement elsewhere in, you know, in your trunk or wherever. Where is that? And then make a little, you can rest when you need to, um, but make a little circle now so that your left hip makes a little circle over the top of your left heel. Where's the circle a bit bumpy? Where's it smooth? Cramp in your calf? Yep. Cramps are what they are. Little epileptic fits in your muscles. <laughs> Good. If you need to just have a quick walk, that's fine. And come back onto your left foot. And with your right foot out to the side and allow your head to hang forward and your back to make a C curve forward. And your weight's more on your heel up to a, it's not such a tragedy this time. And now tilt to the left in order to lift up your right leg, keeping your back kind of slumped. So can you keep your trunk moving as a piece when it's bent over as well? So the degree of bending forwards is up to you in a way that makes us sustainable. If your strategy for bending over is to suck your tummy in, you don't need to because gravity will let you slump over and your belly can stay free. That's it. Stand up for a minute, half a minute, 25 seconds. Come back onto your left foot. And have your right foot in front of you and let your head drop forward and your back curve forward. And in this position, weight not doesn't have to be on the heel necessarily, with the weight for um, with the your trunk bent forwards, and now lift your leg up, right leg up. You can do both. So you can lift it up with all of you. So that counterpoising movement. So the trunk moves in a way that lifts up the foot. So by now, moving the trunk as a piece over the top of the weight-bearing hip probably feels actually easier. Whereas, you know, think back four days, that this kind of tipping action over the top of one hip joint felt really weird. But now lifting the leg in the hip joint maybe feels a bit weird. Maybe. Maybe you just mean that you're getting really good at both ways. So that tipping the whole self back in order to 
lift the leg. However, the, the trunk still stays flexed, but it moves backwards in a flexed position. What the hell? But if you get that counterpoise movement, it actually makes sense. When you, and when you do it, when I watch you doing it, it actually looks, it makes sense. And lifting the leg in, uh, only in the hip joint looks like really hard work. That's what it looks like. But appearances can be deceiving, I know. Walk a little bit. Come back to your spot and stand on your right leg with the left leg out to the side. Oh, actually, we forgot to do something on the left leg. Back on the left leg. Quick, quick. <laughs> left. Now stand on the left leg. Quick. Uh, and so the right leg goes behind you. So slump down. We haven't done this variation before. That's why I missed it. Yep, so slump and the, you, on the right, the right toes behind you and find a way to lift up the foot in this position. So that kind of makes sense, doesn't it, to counterpoise and to, to seesaw over the top of the left hip. It's the best. Yep. And then maybe swing, for, swing the leg forward so that you can do the not-so-best one so that you can see that the two things are actually the same, the same movement, just in a, well, the same organize, kind of organisation in the sense that you drop your shoulders forward and the leg lifts up and then the leg swings forward and the shoulders go back. However, the, the back stays in this C curve. So again, you find, you keep, this is, these are all different variations about finding the top of the hip joint. Finding a way to balance over the top of the hip joint. So you're not falling through it. You're really aligned up over the top of it. That's it. Good. Okay. Phew. See, that was quite an important variation, wasn't it? Okay, come back to standing on your right leg and have your left leg out to the side. And um, we'll go through all of those variations on the right leg now. So remember, this is the slumping forward. So the chin goes to the chest and the back rounds backwards. And <laughs> uh, see how you have to stand up to laugh? <laughs> you had to see. But try having a big belly laugh in this position. That's why I'm saving all my best jokes for later. Otherwise, it makes your head pop up. That's funny in itself, isn't it? You're chuckling into your beard. <laughs> okay. So, moving your right hip a little bit left and right. That was the first variation. Yes, you can be for this first one if you want to try to find the heel. Fish for the heel a little bit. To, if I am absolutely... Uh, Sticking to the transcript, she doesn't say that, but I think it's interesting for you to explore the weight on the heel or not, and then you can leave it, leave it because it is just about making sure that your hip is free in the front to back plane. And then let that go and find a way that your hip joint moves a little bit left and a little bit right. Oh, no, she does say wait to the heel. I beg your pardon. And then you make a circle, remember? No, that's okay. I'm here to remind you. Reverse the circle.
We would walk for a moment. Come back onto your right leg and have the left foot in front of you. So the left big toes on the floor in front of you. And slump, let your lower back go backwards and the head drops forwards. As much as is comfortable. And now begin to lift the leg up. And in this way where your back stays in a C curve, but actually it goes backwards. Your head and your trunk go backwards in order for your leg to come forwards. More forwards, up and forwards. So that you can teeter over that right hip joint. And you can do it the other way if you want, where you're, you kind of fix your trunk in space and just lift from the hip and feel your psoas going, oh, that's interesting. However, that's a, that is a useful movement. If you want to put your socks on, that's useful, isn't it? You don't want to have your shoulders go back backwards if, you want, if you're lifting up your leg to put your socks on. If you want to put your socks on, you need to have your shoulders and your feet come together. Different horses for different courses. Okay, then swing your right leg behind you. So the big, the left big toes on the floor behind you. Slump your head and your shoulders forwards. Small of your back goes back. And in this position, find a way to lift the left foot off the floor as a piece. And can your in intention be very much about rocking over the top of the right head of the femur? Can you almost get a sense of the arc of that movement? The head of the femur is round. Just lie down and have a rest. Have I mentioned the B word today, breathing? Did I need to? About five times. Okay. Here's the sixth time. Are you breathing? Gently roll over and come up to standing. And stand on your, shift your weight onto your right leg. 
and have your right arm over the top of your head. And now bring your left leg up so that your left hand can kind of pick up the back of your left knee. And use, your, use that to bring your right elbow and your left knee together. So we know, we know this lesson. We did this lesson a couple of days ago, sort of, on your back. So it's quite a different proposition in this orientation, isn't it? Orientation means everything. Find a way so they don't have to touch, but how do you find even momentarily this idea of closing the gap between the right elbow and the left knee? Keep your eyes open if that, that helps. I mean, you can have them shut if you want to. But, <laughs> okay. Good, leave that for a moment. If you need to walk, you can walk. If you need to walk. If you want to walk. Different question, isn't it? Need or want. Okay, come back onto your right leg and have your right hand over the top of the head. And now bring your left leg behind you as if you're going to bring the foot and the head together in the back of you. Don't touch. I forbid. I forbid. You can use your left hand to help. You don't have to, but you can, if you want to use your left hand to help, so you can catch yourself around the ankle if you want. But I forbid you to touch. No kicking yourself in the head. You're too precious. So your hands over, if your hands over the top of your head, it's easier. No, no breathing. I forbid. Yeah. That's it. So the back of your head and your foot somehow or other. So, of course, this is just a sneaky way to get you to arch backwards. It's the same movement as arching. It's just you're doing it on one leg. No big deal. What's the big deal? So can you get this sense of, I mean, you're so fixated on the head and the leg coming together that you f this is actually about arching backwards. So getting that sense is the whole of you arching. You can come back to just having the leg out to the side. It's just that we've been a bit meaner about your foot is clearly off. So how do you adjust? How do you still find the top of the right hip joint? with this slightly more dramatic configuration of the left leg. That's it. You're on your right hip joint. And now breathe. Walk a little bit. Did you imagine that you're going to get into that configuration? Diabolical, this, this gear. Good, come back to your spot. And take your weight onto the right leg. If you, you can have your, um, oh no, well, you, if you want your right, no, don't have your right arm. I'm th just thinking it through. Leave your arms as they are. And now begin this movement of bringing your left knee more in the direction of your head and then swinging your, le your left leg back behind you as if you're going to bring the left foot more in the direction of the back of your head. Yeah. 
So you're standing on your right leg and you are bringing your right knee and your, let's say your nose closer together. So in your right, you're on your right leg and you're bringing your left knee more towards your face in front of you. That would make sense. And then you're taking your left foot, swinging it back and taking your left foot more in the direction of the back of your head. An arc forward and an arc back. There we go. And breathe. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Breathing, Mr. Music. To get this sense that your back can round backwards and your eyes look up and your leg goes back and then your leg comes forward and your back goes backwards and your head comes forward. It's lovely. It's lovely. Might not feel lovely, but it looks lovely. Have you noticed how much easier it is to put your stockings and socks on this week? You'll be able to cut your toenails on one leg after this. Or paint your toenails. Yeah, paint your toenails on one leg. Perfect. Even you, Ramon, I want to see painted toenails next segment. And then you can even you can have your leg go behind you and still paint your toenails without looking because you know where your foot is so much. Okay, have a little walk. And when you get back to your spot, when you get back to your spot, look at all these dawdlers, they're thinking, oh, I don't want to get back to my spot. You're going to stand on your left leg and think through, firstly, those two different, so when we did it differently, so you had your, so you have your arm over your head and your, so you stand on your left leg, left arm over your head, right arm helping your left, your right knee to come towards your elbow. So you're really clarifying this forward bend. And do that as many times as you need to. So your arms are there to support the movement. Resting when you want to. And then the opposite movement, and again, you can use your arms to support the movement of your left foot and the back of your head coming together. Our right foot and the back of your head. The, yep. In you, in you take as much time as you need to clarify each movement, thinking it through the whole of your spine. And all the time, of course, you're resting on the top of your left hip joint. And then when you're ready, you can let your arms go free and continue to explore that organization of your spine flexing forward with your leg and then your spine extending to take your head back with your foot back. And Ramon, what are we going to do? Breathe. Gotcha. Gotcha. And have a little laugh because otherwise your diaphragm is too fixed and you can't breathe and you can't extend because your diaphragm won't allow you to fully open your chest and fully close your chest. So a little laugh is your diaphragm's best friend. And your jaw. Good. Leave it. 
walk a bit. Come back to your spot and see how small the movement can be. On You can do it firstly on the right leg and then on the left leg. So that it's, it's small and reversible. So it might only be like a... Ah, oh, he's disembodied again. This is not the disposition of an embodied learner again. But his, his jaws let go oh, and his finger's still up. So rude. The birdie finger, as my boys used to call it. Or the dirty finger, the alternate. Okay, so alternate. But, uh, so on, you're standing on the right leg and you're making this movement of the spine using the leg, the free leg, And so you can get the sense that the movement is happening in, in a very distributed way along your spine and that you can track all of that bending and lengthening. But you get a sense that it's, it's, you're actually lengthening forward and then you're lengthening back in, in, a, in a funny kind of way and that it's reversible. Just keep doing the movement and pay attention is the short answer, the short thing. So the of the bringing the, the knee up towards the nose and then reversing that and taking the heel towards the back of the head. And that your attention is equally divided between the right hip joint and then everything moving around the right hip joint. And it's reversible. So, yes, the right leg just a few times and now the left leg a few times. Just as a kind of refining thing, you know, just come back and clarify any little bits that, you're, that you weren't paying attention to in terms of your whole self. Relaxing your arms so that they can they can help you counterpoise a little bit if you like. It's okay. It's allowable. And at any point you could stop and reverse the movement. Good. Leave it. Come and line your mat. And scan yourself in this position now after all of that gymnastics and sense in your little mind's eye what part of you feels the biggest now, and then the next biggest and then the next biggest and then the next biggest and go ahead and draw yourself Maybe you want to, you know, if you've only got one piece of paper and you've used it all up, you can modify your drawing. Has it changed at all? Or has it, has it refined? Or, or what? What's, is there any difference in the way that you sense in terms of that question? What's the feels the biggest relative to everything else and then the next and then the next? What pops into your mind? Let's see if you can capture that on, on, on paper. Maybe your jaw feels the biggest. That's a pretty symmetrical kind of lesson, so who knows what influence it's had.
And you can you know, keep lying back and checking in and then coming back to your picture. Modify, rearrange. Does your picture look like the girl in the mirror? Are you a bit cubist? A bit? Or is it your pink period or your blue period? Or um, you're a bit Kandinsky, so you're, you know, all over the shop. Self-portrait, you could put it in the Archibald next year. We saw the Archibald. Does that alternate between Sydney and Melbourne, the Archibald? I always thought it was in Melbourne, but it's in, it was in Sydney. It's always in Sydney, is it? The bald Archies. All right. Oh, it is. The, it's always in... Ah, oh, okay. Ah, right. Okay. And then it goes and comes down here though, does it? Because I was thinking, I'm sure I've seen it here, but they share it a bit. Okay. Okay. Well, we saw it in Sydney and it, that's where it is. And, uh, sorry, this year's, yep. Yep. I voted for, um, uh, Robert Hannaford, because he's from Adelaide. How parochial is that? Yeah. But I did like it the best. Okay, lie on your back. Artistic, put your bald archies away. Oh, is there? Um, the border. Oh, yeah, I know. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, I know it would. Oh, it's okay from the MoMA. Yep. Lexi's just telling me there's a Picasso. Is it a, from the Cubist period? Is it all? Oh, yep. There you go. You can go and have a look at the Cubist Picasso. It'll be a uh, girl with a box head. No, <laughs> just joking. Okay, so lying. How are you? How are you? How do you feel about yourself? Do you have a sense of agency in your legs? Is it different one leg to the other? Is it the same? Do they belong to you equally or differently? Do you feel a little more affinity towards one than the other? Has that changed over the five weeks? Oh, five days, five weeks. <laughs> Five whole oh, weeks. Okay, and roll up to standing and stand on both legs. And take a moment to shift your weight from one leg to another. And notice how do you do that? How do you shift your weight? There's a whole lot of stuff you can do even about clarifying the shift of weight. So you, what I can tell you, what I observe is that there's a lot more similarity, bless you, 
across the room in the way you shift your weight. So you're really moving across the top of your hips a lot more. So before people, you know, their strategy for shifting their weight was more maybe sliding their head and then the shoulders or, and then the pelvis, or it was more about pushing themselves from one side to the other. And now of course you're playing and doing it in 64 million ways because you're a bunch of Feldenkrais practitioners and you're playing and now shift your weight onto your left leg and have your right leg out to the side and a few times tilt more to the left and lift up the right leg. And how good is your teapot tipping now compared to Monday? Very gentle little teapot. Very slow little tip and then back. And then stay tilted, but bring and then walk in a tilted position. What the? Can you walk tilted? <laughs> Can you walk like a teapot? So some people do walk like this. How could you normalize the walking? So you actually walk normally, but you still had a tilt. That's very funny. Come back to your spot and straighten yourself up, you lot. Come on, straighten yourself up. And find both hip joints again. Shift your weight onto the right leg. Have your left leg out to the side. And channel your inner teapot this way. So the daughter of a friend of mine makes teapots and she pays a lot of attention to this, the teapot being able to balance around the handle. It's really important, otherwise it doesn't pour properly. So in this instance, your, the, your fulcrum is obviously the, right, the top of the right hip joint. Next time you're pouring a, a teapot, see how it turns around itself to really pour nicely. And keep the keep the tilt to the right and go for a walk. <laughs> you have to empty your teapot. <laughs> And can you normalize the walk with a right-sided tip? And so one will feel easier than the other because we all are a bit asymmetrical. And then slowly let go of your inner teapot and walk in your own way with your own preferred tilts. <laughs> and do you want to walk fast? Do you want to walk slow? Do you have hip joints? What do you want to do with your hip joints? Do you want a can can? Do you want to saunter? Do you want to shimmy? Do you want to Charleston? Do you want to twist? Do you want to jive? Do you want to salsa? Do you want to tango? Do you want to zumba? Do you want to, what did you call it? Electric fish, electric eel, electric worm. Do you want to, do you want to go to sleep? Do you want to lie on your mat? Actually, we'll, fin we'll do a little bit more talking. It's only 10 past 12. Can we, ha can we have the 